Welcome to the Gab Talks by the Independent Press Award. I'm your hostess, Gabby Olzak. Today, we will be speaking with poet Lee Woodman. Her latest poetry collection, Artscapes, was awarded a Distinguished Favorite for Poetry in the 2023 Independent Press Award. The Scapes series of poetry has won numerous awards, including the 2020 William Meredith Award in Poetry, and her essays and poems have appeared in numerous publications. Lee's debut public poetry collection, Mindscapes, was published in 2020. She's received an individual poetry fellowship from the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities in both 2019 and 2020, and a Virginia Center for the Creative Arts Fellowship in 2022. Lee has a bachelor's degree in art from Colby College and a master's degree in art education from Hartford Art School. She's had careers in radio, television, and film production. She's a former manager of multimedia and executive producer at the Smithsonian Institution, senior advisor to the producer, I'm sorry, senior advisor to the director of the National Museum of American History, president of Lee Woodman Media Inc., and VP of Media and Editorial at K-12 Inc., an online education company. A childhood in France and India inspired her passion for art, theater, music, and words. Wow, you are so accomplished, Lee. It's a pleasure to have you. Congratulations, and welcome to the Gap Talks. Thank you. It is such a pleasure and such an honor, and thank you for the award. Of course. Um, so let's get right into it. Um, as I mentioned in your bio, you've had a varied and impressive career, performance, pro producing arts, graphic arts, choreography, uh, interactive media, museum administration. What inspired you to pen your first poem at the age of 66 and why poetry? Great question. Well, I've been a writer all my life. Um, my sister and I, at age four and six, used to write newsletters and put on plays in our driveway. Um, and uh, then in my career, I was a radio and television producer, so writing scripts. And um, then when I was working in the museum, uh, exhibition scripts, strategic plans, all different kinds of writing. Um, when I decided to, and then the same thing when I worked for my own company, but when I decided to retire from working for other organizations um, and go back to my childhood love of art, theater, music, dance, I decided to leave the Smithsonian. That was in 2014. And I said to my boss, you know, I've come full circle. I really want to get back to the arts in some ways. And he said, what have I done wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Um, did and he think you would work there forever? Yes. yes. <laughs> well, most people do. It's a yeah. fabulous place to work. But anyway, um, I had when in when India and France and in college and everything, I had I had really studied dance all my life and art and then music and theater. So um, I didn't know exactly what I was going to do because at age 66, you, you don't have quite the capabilities you have to do all those things. And um, I took my first poetry class at the Writer Center here in um, Bethesda, Maryland. And I was blown away. I just loved it. It seemed to bring together my writing interest, my dance interest, my language interest, and then, um, you know, also music and dance. And so Artscapes really pulls in um inspirations from all those different art forms and that was the fun of writing artscapes so artscapes is your third poetry collection it's an ecrastic poem collection based on 20th century modern art from the national gallery the moma the guggenheim the prada the louvre um tell tell our listeners who may not be familiar um with that type of poetry what what it's all about Okay, and I'm going to read something too, so it makes sense. <laughs> yes, I was yeah. hoping you would. Yeah, well, what I do with writing any kind of poetry on any topic, and all four books have different uh, themes, is um, first do just a lot of staring. And uh, for visual arts, people can imagine my staring at a lot of galleries and uh, museums and um, street shows. 
And I always carry this little notebook with me and I jot down things that I find interesting or phrases I hear people say as they're, as they're seeing the work. And um, then I go back home and research and really look at the background of the maker of the art, the, the choreographer, the composer. And um, then it becomes clear to me what my idea for my poem is going to be and what format it should be in, because there's so many different kinds of poetry you can write. Mm -hmm. You know, there's free verse, there's villanelles, there's pantoums, there's haikus, there's sonnets. It just goes on and on. So that's part of the fun of it, too. So let's see. I'll read one um, poem from Arts Artscapes that was inspired by a piece of art by Andy Warhol in the National Gallery. And um, I feel when I go into a room of art that an artwork chooses me and I walk right over like, like a magnet, you know, and um, then start my looking. So um, what he, specifically about this, the piece of art that spoke to you? You said oh, it loses well, you. What specifically about this one? Well, it's in the poem, but it's a, it's a picture of um, Mao. And um, he, uh, uh, Andy, Andy Warhol did many, many different um, studies of Mao and then in many, many different colors, and they exist in several museums all over the world now. But this one is called Vanquor. And this is uh, his piece done in 1973. Mao chooses me, massive man, square head, solid stance, leader, CCP, Deep purple background, violet wash. I must stop. Struck still in the gallery, I conjure his maker, Andy Warhol, because he's there too. Golden plumage, same two tufts of hair, both heads the shape of Hello Kitty. <laughs> Lurking from behind, Warhol slips into the chairman's left sleeve. Bodies morph, merge as portrait, breathe in unison. By reflex, my hand clasps my chest, an autonomic gasp. I realize they're wearing my blouse. Single button, three is one, we pledge allegiance. Hands crossing hearts, their countenance exactly mine. Stony stare, contemplating. Six nostrils blend into two. Our lipstick is lavender, our chins set. Who is who? I am Chairman Mao. Wow, that was fantastic. Um, definitely a connection uh, and meaning through the imagery and the words. You, you, I mean, I can see the uh, the work in front of me without seeing it. Definitely imagine it in my mind's eye. Oh my goodness. That's just thrilling to hear. And you know, I always feel like um, people listening to my poems are kind of making their own pictures and own stories and sort of writing alongside me. And that's the thrill of being a poet and doing performance art um, and reading like this. You know, it's wonderful to be able to do an interview to talk about the book and the life and the marketing and, and all of that. But uh, the reading is the part that is so thrilling. Uh, so, so what emotions do you hope to evoke with your poetry, with any of your poetry and all of the scapes? You know, that's a great question, uh, Gabby. Um, there are so many emotions that come through poems. And uh, I'll tell you some of the topics, and then, that, and then you'll understand some of the emotions. The first book on homescapes was about growing up in India and then coming to the United States for the first time as a 14-year-old and being in a sophomore 
New Hampshire small high school. Well, well, Lee, let's give our re- let's give our listeners a little background. So you grew up in France and India, and you did not move back to the United States until you were fourteen Four. years old. Okay, so the the um, scapes collection you have Mindscapes, which was your debut, Homescapes, and Lifescapes. So um, continue. I would like you to tell us the behind each scapes. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to talk about homescapes first because that's when I was youngest. What and and got and got the idea when I started poetry, even though I didn't write it until I was um, 66. So my, my father was an avid photographer and filmmaker and recorded everything. And of course, you remember so so much. So I was, uh, we were first in Madras and then in New Delhi. And in Madras, I went to an Indian convent school, even though my parents were not Catholic. Um, And uh, we had school outdoors and, um, uh, you know, it was a different kind of curriculum, although we did math, science, music and everything uh, the history we studied certainly was different than American history. So that was all all very new when when I came back to the States. I imagine. <clears throat> yeah. And so one of the poems that I wrote that's actually um, I chose the form of um, a villanelle, which has a repetition. And you'll see in certain lines that repeat and repeat. And it's a way of really pushing forward an idea that's so emotional for someone who uh, has maybe not just one home, but several homes. And with immigration, I think people who hear this poem today, and they always tell me this, feel very moved about what it means to have a home. Home leave. What should I answer? How to explain? Do you really go to school in New Delhi? We were curious strangers, both home and away. Three months of questions, some hard to convey. Do you speak Hindu? Do you wear saris? What should I answer? How to explain? Do you ride elephants? Been to Bombay? Do you eat curry? And what is a lychee? We were curious strangers, both home and away. What are you doing in the USA? Do you like TV? Know how to ski? What should I answer? How to explain? Well, we're visiting family. Dad's on holiday. We love grandma's ice cream. We're glued to TV. We were (laughs) curious strangers, both home and away. On return to New Delhi, my friends would all say, where were you during the lights of Diwali? How should I answer? How to explain? We were curious strangers, both home and away. Wow, I love that. Um, that's actually, uh, I think, the feeling that a lot of people get when they immigrate from one country to another. Really, neither one really feels like home. And I think that you communicated that and you feel like a stranger in in both places. And um, that was beautiful. Well, thank you. And, you know, uh, I feel like I'm a global citizen. My parents were very, very adventuresome. And um, they so my father was born Unitarian, uh, third generation Unitarian and my mom a Baptist. But she switched when she married my dad. And then we went to India when we were so young. My mom, eight months pregnant with my next sister. Wow, and, that was brave. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, she told people, oh, you know, I think I think there's been a lot of babies born in India. I think I'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they took us because there weren't, you know, the the normal churches we might have had in um in America or or maybe European countries, they took us everywhere. We went to mosques, we went to temples, we went to um, uh, all kinds of art um, experiences, street parades, um, Independence Day parades and so forth. 
So um, we really got this other way of knowing about the world and knowing about um, languages and the have and have nots and um, different smells and different tastes and uh, different colors. So I do write about colors too. So Lee, you said that you're spiritually open to all faiths, but your true religion is education and exploration. Yeah. Tell us about that. that <laughs> Well, you know, that's one of the reasons I'm writing Soulscapes right now, because... Your fifth collection. Yes, this is the fifth collection. It's um, it's just finished. I just sent it off to my editor, and then it will... Congratulations. Go... <laughs> I know, it's like, a, this is a, a celebratory day, Gabby. We're, we're, we're Wonderful. Doing... <laughs> Glad to share it with you. That's great. <laughs> So spiritually, I, I would call myself a seeker who admits and uh, ponders all kinds of gods. And um, because I learned to be open to all aspects of faith, um, not only the ones in, in India and the Middle East and so forth, but Native American um, beliefs, uh, uh, tribal beliefs in countries that were very nature oriented. And um so I started to do some deep research into uh, different kinds of beliefs and practices and like origin stories, spirit animals, tarot, witchcraft, lucid dreaming. There's so many different ways of knowing in the world. And I found this completely fascinated because I'm part skeptic, rational skeptic, and part um you know, part believer uh, in, in things that aren't aren't really explainable by logic, mm -hmm. and so poetry seems to be the perfect way to love both the science based factual world and the magical, mysterious unknown. So, so do, you see, do you see poetry as somewhat of a bridge between the spiritual and the scientific worlds? Then I do. Tell, tell us how, um, can you read us one of your poems from Soulscapes that would evoke that feeling the most? Absolutely. Um, I'll read one, I'll read the first one and then I'm gonna read one of the spirit animal ones. Um, so the first one is called A Child Asks and I opened the book this way because I it's an invitation for readers to think, well, Let's consider these what ifs and um, think about nature, think about um, past lives, think about um, m people who believe in ghosts or, or, or want to communicate with the dead. So anyway, a child asks, what is God? I think not darkly, God is death. If ashes are ashes, and dust is dust, I go underground and rest. There I am fertilized by loam and water, beckoned by life to be. When ready, I push up and bloom color, never knowing the hue. I answer the child who instinctively knows azure is azure, Scarlet is scarlet, and God is in the flower. Beautiful, just beautiful. Um, which scapes collection has been has had the most significant impacts on your life, Lee? The Soul Scapes is the fifth one. It seems to be a very powerful uh, collection of poems. Well, thank you. And it was a big experiment because you can imagine that there, uh, there are a lot of feelings about what to believe and how to believe. But what I found in studying all these different things that really human beings are looking for the same kind of things overall. They want a community. They want a sense of meaning in the world uh, bigger than themselves. Um, and uh, there are myths and symbols in traditional religions, and there are myths and symbols in uh, voodoo and uh, witchcraft. 
you know, it's not all that dissimilar. It's just, you kind of have to open your brain to mm -hmm. think, wow, people come to understanding things in, in many different ways. But I think the probably the, one of the hardest books for me to write because it was a, a difficult human experience and it was also during COVID and that was a separation and divorce um, during COVID and then um, moving. I moved out of DC because it was so hard to be isolated in an apartment mm -hmm. by myself and not be able to use all my usual um, writing places. I have a carol at the Library of Congress, but everything was closed down. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> there was construction yeah. under my building and I my floor was bouncing up and down and there was drilling. And so I moved to the Hudson Valley for two years and um, then came back because I really am a city girl. <laughs> and um, I'm so I'm glad to be so here much. with my poetry community and everything. But what happened just before, when the marriage started to crumble, I had a very, very different um, experience. I fell, I had a concussion taking care of my grandchildren. Oh my. And um, was very careful trying to get them out of a, a bath and told them to, to wait till I was in there to come out and got them out safely. And then I slipped and cracked my head on a um, cement overhang and lost one eye um, to our Wow. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. And, yeah. So that's been a, a process of healing, you know, um, healing from everything, healing from a, a, a marriage that fell apart, healing from not, you know, I had been a dancer, I had been a runner, a swimmer, and all of a sudden I was learning to walk again, um, taking, you know, brain conceptual classes with vision um, to relearn depth, perception, and balance, and all of that. So um, I'll read you one from that. Um, and, and Lee, that was from your Lifescapes collection, correct? Yes. Okay. So yes, I was going to ask you, please read us um, something from that. Gabby, you're so generous. <laughs> it's beautiful. I'm enjoying it. Okay. It was different than fainting. It's not what you imagine how darkness covers. You can't know, can you? You pay attention to something else, then it happens while you're watching. A moment before concussion, total concentration on a task, a careful task, the grasping for a grandchild's hand, you step from the tub. Resounding thud, head to ledge, lower teeth rattle, you search for sight, yet only hear the child singing. Oh, athlete, no longer will you be sure-footed on the track. No more will you take two steps at a time. Between composing countless stanzas, you left the web of family. Blackness drove the lights out. You must know it could happen, flash of a second the before, the after of forever. Wow, really powerful. Um, so what do you love so much about poetry, Lee? Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting puzzle, Gabby. Um, you know, it allows you to look and listen to all the things you're really interested in. And then um, it forces you to figure out how to say something in a very succinct way. Every word counts. And you don't have time to go into a lot of dialogue or explanation. And so using metaphor and simile and um, uh, interesting kind of rhymes, not just at the end of a line, but within lines, um, you know, uh, consonants and um, vowels that have just this wonderful, wonderful sound to it. Some people call poetry mouth music. Mm. <laughs> so that's what I love about it. And then it's um, 
I, I, I love also having finished um, a collection and a topic and then thinking, okay, what's going to come next? <laughs> don't, don't steal my next question, Lee. That's <laughs> what's going to come up soon. So um, what would you, what would you say to someone who is, again, you, this is a second career for you, really. Uh, what would you say to someone, uh, a, a, a person who's just starting out and aspires to become a poet? For you, it seems to have been an accidental career. Well, I do think that having written all my life, you know, you're you're very aware of grammar, you're very aware of syntax. Um, so uh, studying is is great. And even though I came to poetry late, oh my gosh, in the last eight years, I've taken so many classes and gone to workshops and mm -hmm. studied in, you know, Washington, New York, Iowa, California. And um, I will be a student for the rest of my life because there are, well, first of all, there's such a canon of uh, poets from the West and poets from the East that are exquisite. And uh, then there are so many contemporary poets writing in different ways, um, especially now since, of, uh, you know, the change of technology and the change of music um hip hop and rap music have made a, a big change for the way youth uh approach performance art and slam poetry and that's been really wonderful because yeah what do you think about all of that i mean that really has brought the youth into this genre there's a big uptick in readers and performers and then you know amanda gorman being um president biden's choice for poet laureate inaugural mm -hmm. poet oh yeah Incredible. And, uh, Bob Dylan winning the Nobel Prize for literature for 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 poetry, and uh, then this um, surge of um, performance art and um, ch and uh, kids memorizing poems and um, just learning to present them in such professional ways. You know, when I tell a kid, or, you know, an old person or a young person, now I'm a poet. They go, Oh. <laughs> Oh, why would I do that? <laughs> you probably wouldn't have gotten that about 30 years ago. No, no, people would yes. have moved to the other side of the lounge. <laughs> like, oh, you're just a poet. I see. Okay. So that, you know, that's good advice for aspiring poets that, um, and smart people know this, that every day is a learning opportunity and you can always learn more. And there are always people um, who can teach you valuable lessons and, and tools that you can use in your craft. Um, what, what's something surprising you've learned about yourself during this journey? Well, I'm surprised at how much my forays into the business world have helped because, um, when I had my own business in particular, but also at the Smith, uh, Smithsonian Library of Congress, um, in radio and, in uh, film and television, uh, even though you have um, people in the, the stations and the networks who do some of the scheduling and some of the program, you have to learn to be a really good marketer and to be mm -hmm. able to talk about your work and so forth. And so um, I went out into the business world. Um, one of the reasons I went to K-12 Inc., was, um, you know, I was bringing to them knowledge of multimedia and um production and editorial, but it was there that I learned um, marketing and how important it was to be first to market with your product. And um, my niece, who uh, I, I've had a lot of mentees, I love, love working with younger employees and, um, and younger people in general. And my niece, who had actually um, been in childhood education and liked it and taught got to a point where she, uh, being single, wanted to make a better living. And she said, you know, do you have any suggestions? And I said, yeah, I would go to business school. And then I would bring your knowledge, whether it's about writing or poetry or art or uh, elementary school, to a much bigger frame of understanding how people uh, look for products, how they um, respond to advertising, 
how to speak in public and all of that. And she did it and um, it, it really worked. And I see that time and time again. Um, what is your hope for, for poetry going forward? Poetry is a genre. Well, for the world, I hope that uh, that more and more people um, catch the fever. <laughs> um, and I think that's happening. You know, there are so, so, so many independent presses now um, uh, publishing poetry and really good poetry. And I think that... Um, MFA programs are are growing by leaps and bounds, mm -hmm. and and you know that's an op that's an option. It's not a requirement to be um, a poet, but it's certainly um, a way to learn. Um, and I hope for poetry in the world. There's a very interesting study going on uh, that's a combination of the National Institute for Health, Aspen Institute, Kennedy Center, some of the leading um, musicians and artists in the world, like Renee Fleming, Yo-Yo Ma, uh, drummers. Um, and they are studying with physicians and um, scientists the effect of arts on the brain. And this project is called the Neuro Arts Blueprint. It's in its second year. And uh, it is really proving, not just by anecdotal evidence, but by measurements of the brain, electrical um, and mag magnetic measurements, that um, art, dance, music are helping veterans with trauma, children with autism, People in general who feel fearful, they have a certain amount of calm and uh, ease of tension when uh, working with art or hearing literature or poetry. And then music is incredible for adults with dementia. That's amazing. Um, I, I really hope that the world does uh, catch on to that because these are fantastic benefits to especially music I know it has an incredible uh, impact on um, children with autism and just anyone with disabilities it's it's just amazing so I know that you just finished Soulscapes it's your fifth collection congratulations and it's at is it at the publisher now Lee it's at the editors now okay. and um, I don't know how much time we have here what how are we doing we're, we're, we're good. We're good. Okay. I, I want to find out when, it, when you think it'll be published, um, where our listeners can buy it. Uh-huh. So let me tell you everything about where people can find out about all the books and all the new ones coming. Please. Yes. Okay. So a very, very easy website, poetleewoodman.com, spelled uh, poet, Lee, L-E-E, -E, Woodman, D, uh, w -O -O -D -M -A -N com. It has all four um, published books there with the uh, publisher information, with all the bookstores where they can be bought. Um, and then there's, um, I, I, I actually uh, have a lot of recordings on the website so people can sample from each book or from readings that I've done um, that are composite readings. And um, what else is on there? Oh, um, possibility to sign up for my mailing list because I send out um, information about when I'm going to be performing next or reading next. And uh, there, that's where I'll put all the information about Soulscapes. Okay. A, a book usually takes about a year to get published once mm -hmm. it's finished. It, um, it goes through the editing stage, then there's the uh, choosing of the artwork for the cover. You have to get blurbs from um, other poets or other artists or whatever the topic's about to, um, you know, to, to apply to your book. And then um, you have to be very careful about acknowledging any poems that are in the new book that may have been published in a journal before. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's all legit, but um, 
not only polite to acknowledge that, but a requirement. So, um, and then, you know, the placement, uh, some books are made in a, in a horizontal format, some in a more vertical format. So the, um, the publisher and uh, their, their uh, staff have a lot of work to do and just getting it on the page in a good way. Oh, it's, it's definitely a process. So I, I know you just finished Soulscapes. This might be a little premature, but what's next? <laughs> <laughs> well, when I started writing schools, uh, Soulscapes, I had two things in mind. I was going to write uh, something called Screenscapes because, um, because I grew up in India in the 50s and early 60s. There were, there were no televisions in homes then. And um, so no television, but we had radio and I was fascinated by radio. I used to listen to Radio Salon, <laughs> which now would be Radio Sri Lanka uh, to Voice of America. And so that's wow. where I learned about Chubby Checker and <laughs> wow, yeah, the Beatles and everything. Um and then the irony of it was when I came to the States, I uh, got interested through my uh, through my college work and then through my um, getting into my career in radio and, and television into television, became a television producer, never had, it, had one as a kid. Um, so I think it's kind of an interesting story how you ap approach producing when you haven't had a lifetime of watching and then after I retired from the Smithsonian, I became a binger. <laughs> <laughs> so I might write uh, screenscapes. I might call it binge or I might call it screenscapes. But it's kind of a look at the history of television through the eyes of a kid who didn't have it for a long, long time and then became an expert in it and then became a watcher of it. Wow, that sounds fascinating. We'll look forward to that. So thank you, Lee. Um, this has been so wonderful speaking with you. Um, congratulations on Soulscapes. We're looking forward to reading it. And uh, we hope to see Screenscapes within the next year or two or Bingescapes, whatever you choose to do. Um, <laughs> but thank you for sharing your journey with us. It's been a pleasure. Well, thank you so much, Gabby. I'm so impressed by what you and Ted are doing and about the reach you have. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Lee. It was really great. This is your hostess, Gabby Olzak. Until we meet again, keep on reading.